turn on a heat source or anything like regular encaustic wax. So I just want to show you guys in case anybody hasn't seen it. This is my big giant gallon tub of wax. I just started with this this year and I'm made quite a dent into it, but it's just literally a soft pliable medium and I just put it down on my palette. I'm going to come down here just a little bit because I'm going to be mixing up some paint for you guys. I don't even know if you can see my palette. I'm going to do that for a little bit because I'm going to talk about how I mix it into my paint. So just making sure we can see everything really good. So here is some paint that I have already mixed. If you're anybody who likes to paint thick and really impasto, you know that you run into problems with just straight up oil paint because you run into potential cracking problems. Um, it's the whole fat over lean theory that you can't have a thick layer and put a thin layer back on top because you could crack that thin layer that dries faster. So this kind of resolves that. It will also give your painting a lot more volume. Your paint will become, you're not gonna use as much as if you like to paint thick. It will also add a lot of volume to your paint. It will add transparency and will also make it dry a little bit more matte which I really like with my painting. So this is a pile here that I mis mixed up while I was waiting to come on, but I'm gonna show you guys exactly the concoction that I mix when I get my palette ready to start painting. So I'm just gonna go ahead and grab um, a little bit of a cobalt teal and place this small little amount of paint on my palette. Then I grab about 50% wax. That's my, my little um, ratio, 50% paint, 50% wax. And I can add more wax if I want it to be even more transparent. What I do like to do, however, is I don't just stop there. I like to do some glazing when I first start. So what I'll do is I'll add either Gamblin Galkid gel or I'll add regular Galkid medium. Now these mediums are both the same, just one is much thicker. And I think you can see up here on my palette, I have the gel, which is nice and thick. So if I make some marks with this in my paint, it'll leave a nice thick mark that won't settle. And then the gal kit is a little bit thinner, so it's good for dripping and glazing. So what I'm gonna start with is I'm just gonna pick a little bit of it up on my knife and I don't have any specific ratio. I just kind of mix it in until it feels good and kind of nice and smooth. By adding this medium in, this will make my paint dry a little bit more shiny. It will cut down the matteness of the cold wax. So when I start with my first layers, I usually wanna start thin, and then eventually I start working thicker. So this is just my straight up um, cobalt teal, but what I wanna do is I wanna gray that down a little. So I have some transparent orange. So just off to the side, I'm gonna mix a little transparent orange into here and you can see I've got this really pretty kind of green color, but I'm gonna take a little bit of my, I always like to use a warm white. I don't like to use just straight up white. I think it gives me a lot more of a natural color and I'm mixing this really nice, beautiful green, but I'm actually gonna put a little bit more turquoise in it because I really wanna get a little bit more of a grayed out duller color. Now, if you're ever having a problem and you're like, this is just not getting to the color I want, what I like to introduce you guys to is Chromatic Black by Gamblin. This is the only black that is on the color wheel that's completely neutral. It is made from phthalo green and quinacridone red. And those two colors are directly across each other on the color wheel. So it's not gonna turn your color to a different color, like red and black a lot of times will, if you're using ivory black, will turn to a purple. But in this case, I just wanna show you, if I just add a little bit of that chromatic black, I'm gonna be in that same kind of green color in here, but I'm gonna gray it down. It doesn't change the color, it just changes the value of it and it just kind of gives me a nice grayed down color. And I like playing with some neutrals and grays when I'm working. So because I just put a lot more paint in this, I'm just gonna add a little bit more wax. And I just like to mix up my colors a bit before I get going. And I always like to make sure I have a variety of values. So I wanna make sure I have another darker value. So I'm gonna take a little bit of my cobalt teal, just mix it directly into my, my neutral black and look how beautiful of a black. It's not making it chalky. It's not making it an ugly dull black. It's really still vibrant. So you can just tell that it's just a shade of that cobalt teal. 
So again, I'm gonna just mix a little bit of wax into it. But just when I mix it up for you, I think you'll be able to see, I just got double the amount of oil paint on here by adding my wax. I'm gonna add again, just a little bit of my Gelkid. Because in the beginning, I wanna work thin. So when we're talking about all these mediums, I am gonna to talk to you in a little bit about working thick. But I, a lot of times, will actually mix my own pigment as well by just using dry pigment. Sometimes I'll use charcoal powder for my darks. I really love to work with my paintings with charcoal first, then I paint on top of them. And I always thought that I was kind of betraying the purest um, oil painter. And I realized that a lot of artists, and traditional artists, like the great masters worked with charcoal first. And they actually used thin pieces of paper and picked holes through it. And then they would take their charcoal dust to transfer their drawing onto their canvases. So once I found out about that and they were able to analyze some old master's paintings, I was like, all right, so I'm not like breaking the rules. This is something that people have been doing forever. And that gets me into the history of cold wax. So cold wax, well not cold wax as it is, Cold wax has a little bit of resin in it and a little bit of Gamsol, which is a solvent that ga uh, Gamblin makes. But it has been used for centuries to protect paintings. So a lot of times when paintings were finished, they would put a coat of wax on top of them to protect them from bugs and decay. So this is something that's been around forever and it's just kind of made a resurgence, out, resurgence on the art scene. So um, I'm gonna kind of pull up a little bit now so you can see a little bit more of my board. And these are some of the tools I'm gonna to use to get started. This is a bowl scraper from the kitchen store. This is a catalyst, just a squeegee. I like to use um, brayers for printmaking. This is for making sculptures and I have a variety of knives, but I also use brushes. So I just want you to remember that even though we're doing this with wax and I am more of an abstract artist, this technique can be used both abstractly or with any realistic painting. If you wanna build up texture and get some contrast between smooth areas of your paintings and really build up your texture, you don't wanna go through a lot of paint, cold wax is the medium for you. I actually started out initially hearing about this from Robert Burridge and he's an acrylic painter and he never liked the real shiny look that his acrylic paintings had so he would take some cold wax medium and put it on top of the finished acrylic painting, wait for it to dry for about 24 hours, and then buff it dry. And then that would kind of dull down that shine from the acrylic paint. And then I met Mark Russell, who introduced me to cold wax and it changed everything for me. So I'm gonna get started showing you guys first how to just use this cold wax and paint and start working thinly to create a painting. And a lot of times everyone says, well, how do I start um, an abstract painting? So one thing that I'll do that I learned back when I took my very first design class at Harper College was just to make myself a little bit of a grid. So I'm just gonna come on, this is a piece of um, Arches oil paper. It's just like heavy watercolor paper, except it's actually treated to hold oil paint. When you first get it, it's just white. So the back side of it, it's just white. But I did glaze it with transparent earth orange, which I added in my mixture here, just so I had a coating of color so I can really show you what layer one looks like versus layer two, which is what I would start with. But here's my little piece of charcoal. And I'm just gonna come in and make a couple little marks just to give myself something to kind of hold on to once I start painting. I don't have to stick with this. But what I love about it is I can kind of mush the charcoal around. I can take a little Gamsol right now and kind of melt some of my charcoal just so I can get an idea of what I might want to do for a composition. So I'm just going to do kind of a traditional cruciform composition here to get you going. And this is just really thin Gamsol and charcoal. I'm going to dab some of it out. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start using my darkest color that I mixed up, this nice kind of grayed down uh, cobalt teal. And I'm going to come in, I loaded it up on my brayer, and I'm just going to start kind of playing with it. So I have it loaded on the brayer, and I'm going to start pressing onto my board. 
And when I press into the board, I get a really nice uneven coating onto this, this paper. And then if I pull the paint, so this is kind of like working with a glaze. If any of you have ever worked with glazes or at the end of a painting to kind of change the harmony of color, same kind of concept, except I just happen to have a coat of wax. The wax will dry the paint a lot faster, which is very convenient for me. And again, it'll add transparency. Look how nice and transparent this is. I like to use cheesecloth when I'm working. So here's a nice crusty piece of cheesecloth and the more disgusting and crusty it gets, the better it works. So I may come in here now and just start softening up some edges to see what I have going on with this first layer. So I'm being mindful of soft edges and hard edges. So I'm just adding a little bit color right now. I have more paint on here, so I'm just gonna leave it for right now, but I'm gonna show you a different variety of tools. So now I'm gonna come in with this kind of mid-value color, this nice green. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this brayer to start applying some paint. Now what I'm not doing is like I'm painting the wall in the house where I'm like gonna cover every single corner of this painting with color. I'm just gonna kind of play around and get a nice uneven coverage. If I wanted to, I could take my knife and put a nice fuller, more saturated, heavier color on here. That's fine too. But I'm still just trying to build up the, the structure of my painting. And, and I don't really know where it's going at this point. I'm just kind of playing with it. So that, that first layer, that orange, is going to peek through, but maybe not so much. Now I'm going to come in with my knife and just apply a bit of that cobalt teal. And I'm just going to kind of drag it across the composition. I can come in again and tap it a little bit. But what's great is even with this thin coat, I can still come in now with a little toothpick. I just like to use a little toothpick as a tool and I can start carving in texture and pulling out that turquoise color to show the orange underneath. If I were to set this away and let it dry, when I would come back, those little bumps and raises in the paint would affect my next glazed layer and make a different mark on the painting. So this is kind of like the type of technique that you have to use patience. I work on many, many paintings at one time. I can just kind of scratch in here, pull some of that orange out, and I can always soften it back up here. But you just kind of play with it as you're going and just see what kind of marks you're making. I'm also gonna come in now with a brush just to show you that you can paint with this with a brush. I was at one time using my cold wax when I was doing plein air paintings, but I realized when I was outside in the heat, it was just drying so fast that I literally couldn't move the paint around, even if I added mediums into it. So make sure you guys can see what I'm doing here. And uh, so I kind of gave that up. And so when I do my plein air painting, I just am kind of more purist about it. And I just use my straight up uh, oil paint. If I wanna build something up at a later date, then I might come back in and use a little wax, but um, I just do not like using it when I'm outside painting. So now I'm just creating some contrast here by doing like a little bit of like a milky wash of that light color. It's just off white plus, plus white, I mean plus wax. So it just kind of makes a lighter color for me. And again, I wanna watch my edges. I wanna soften some edges up And then I may come back and start seeing uh, what do I want to do with this? And I may come back in and pull another tool and grab a little bit more turquoise. And I'm just going to drag it across the whole painting. Then I can use the edge of this. This I use a lot to kind of pull out that underpainting as well. So I'm using that squeegee to put on and remove paint all at the same time. And right now, again, this is just very thin paint. And see, I can pull some of it back out. If I decide I want a lighter value, I may not like any of that first mark that I made with the charcoal. So I could just play with it a little bit more, soften something. And right now my painting is getting a little bit wet, but this is the start of an abstract oil and cold wax painting. 
I feel like I need to put some of my darks back in, so I'm going to come in and play with this big squeegee again and just start pulling in. Maybe I want a little bit more of like a dark horizon line, and I can kind of play with it and make little shapes. So maybe I want this to look like it's the edge of a, a landscape, and maybe this is a tree line off in the distance. Make sure I'm like right in front of you guys. And I might pull up a little bit of my green from my palette and just apply, just tap that on the top. I can pull some of that down to look like my reflection. Pop a little bit of that green back in. But the funnest part about it is just watching the history of it develop. So as I do a layer and let it sit and dry, and typically I might let it dry for an hour, two hours, and come back to it and apply my next layer, or I can let it sit for a day, but it usually takes like a, about a good few hours just to get this to, to dry up. So I'm just gonna let this sit for right now, and I'm gonna show you another technique that I can do on this right now. So I like to call it the resist method. And so what I have in this little dropper bottle is something called orange terpene. And orange terpene is basically like paint thinner on steroids. It's kosher and it's, it's used in like a big machinery for food processing. So it's not as harmful for you as everybody likes to think all these solvents are, but um, it's gonna do a really cool thing right now, which is one of the, the greatest effects you can get when you're using your cold wax medium. So I put it in this little applicator and then I can come in, I'm just gonna turn my painting flat and I'm just gonna drop a couple drips. I can make lines if I wanted to, but I just put a few drips in. I don't even know if you can see it, but it just has a little bit of a, a shine from it from where I put that on and I can let it sit for a few minutes. But I'm going to try to rush it for you guys so you don't get bored with this. And then I just come back on with my brayer, but I want to make sure my, my tools are not covered in paint. And I'm just going to come in and I'm going to take this squeegee and I'm going to pull that off. And I'm able to make really cool marks with using something more organic, something I couldn't make with a tool myself if I thought about it. And this, because it's still so wet, I should have let this set up for about a half an hour, but I can pull really cool organic shapes. And again, next layer of paint I might put on this, I would cover this up some more, maybe pull some of it back. So I would just keep, you know, working with this and asking myself a lot of questions. And I always think about the three C's. It's what I call the three C's. I think about my composition. I think about my color that I'm using. And I think about contrast. So when I'm looking at it, I'm constantly asking myself these design questions. So even at this early phase of a painting, is there contrast? And my question, my answer to myself right now is no, I need to do a little something. So I'm adding a little bit more white paint. And again, it's just straight up warm white, but you're gonna see some of the other paint through it. And if I press hard, I can remove more. And if I press light, I can just make little tiny marks. Add a little bit of that down here, but I want it to be very thin. So I have a light, a medium, and a dark. I feel like I'm starting to build up the idea that this could be a landscape. But the fun thing when you're first playing with cold wax, if you guys brought your wax, we'll do a little project later, is you just wanna see what kind of mark the tools can make. And maybe I make a couple little horizontal lines in here, some small ones, some bigger ones. Again, if I don't like them, if there's too many, I can dot them out. When I have a lot of wax, like in this area up here, I have a little bit of thicker wax, so I can even take a paper towel or a piece of paper, crumple it up and press it into here, and it will make a look almost like leather, like a piece of leather. So it's all about building up textures. And every time you build a texture, you can come back over it and the nooks and crannies will pick up the paint in a completely unexpected way. So what I'm gonna do for right now is just let this one set for a minute. And again, I think you guys can see that pretty close. And I have another one I wanna double on, which is a different surface. 
And this is one that I just did one little go over. I just did exactly the same steps I showed you. I just made a little bit of a grid. I just grabbed some leftover paint and wax. And you can see here, this is that resist technique that I showed you where I splashed a little bit of paint thinner on it. Sometimes I like to use just regular Gamsol in one of these spray bottles, these heavy duty, like from Menards or Home Depot spray bottles. And I can just spritz it and I get more of like a complete random, I just stuck my painting in a bunch of wax and I can get more of a, a unique patterning. But again, this is just layer one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you later two, layer two and I'm gonna keep developing this painting. So using some of the, the colors that I had already mixed, I wanna make sure I can get into this a little bit better for you. I want you to see the palette and the painting. Um, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna start applying some lights. When I first used this painting, I had a regular white on and it looks really chalky to me. So now this is just wax and paint and I can just apply this on top of this dry layer. And this is a gesso board. Gesso boards, I love working on this with because they're really hard. And if I scratch into them and poke into them to remove layers of paint, I'm not gonna like dent a hole into it like I would if I was on a canvas. So here you can see too, even if I pull all the way down this painting, I'm changing the whole look and then see if I keep working at it, I can add some more, oops, I just lost my tool. I can add all kinds of different effects. And do you see where I had that little bit of some line work? You can see how it's picking up the paint in random different ways. So every layer just keeps building on top of each other to add more dimension and depth in your paintings. A lot of times what I'll like to do is work with transparent paint colors and then work with opaque paints. And if I work on those each layer, you'll see that, see how it's already kind of pulling all of this dry paint that's underneath with that cobalt teal in a different way. And it just looks so cool. And it's like, it's not as deliberate as it would be if you were doing a traditional painting, which gets me back to those three C's. And as I play with this, I'm just gonna talk about those just a little bit. So I wanna make sure my composition looks cool. And that might change as I'm working on my painting. But for right now, I have a little bit of a composition going and that's good enough for me. And then I wanna ask myself again, do I have contrast? Do I have contrast in color? Right now I do. Do I have contrast in, let's use a different tool so I can keep showing you guys different tools. Do I have contrast in value? Do I have contrast in texture? And that is something that I don't really have just yet because everything is still that thin glaze. But I'm still just kind of glazing in some color. I'm gonna add a little bit of green in here with this knife. And if I just scratch it, pushing really hard with my knife, I can really kind of blend it in with that cobalt teal a little bit more. Remember, this green was made with cobalt teal and transparent orange. So I like to make sure I'm using colors that kind of work with each other. You know, using the whole, um, you know, color wheel, using your opposite, but I have an opaque color and then a transparent color. So now I'm going to take some of this dark again, put in some more of this dark, kind of darken it up down here. And maybe now I'm going to use a different tool and I'm going to load my brayer. And I don't have to keep everything just the same, same angle, but now I'm starting to get some cool effects. I'm starting to really pull in some of this paint. I can cover some of this up. Because that was just the white of the canvas and that's boring, who likes that? So I can just build that up, maybe kind of give myself a little bit of a vignette around the corner. But, you know, I don't know if I'm digging it. I don't know if it's still looking cool. So now what we can start doing is adding some different things. I'm gonna do some resist on it. This has all been basically a glaze, but now I'm gonna show you guys how to really thicken up your paint. So I'm gonna let this sit for a little bit. And I've got both of my projects here that I can add that with. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some of my paint mixture 
Make sure I've got a nice clean knife. And I almost always wear gloves when I do this just because there are solvents and everything. The wax has a little bit of solvent in it. Um, and you know, I do try to run as much of a solvent free studio as I can. I use um, safflower oil to kind of clean my brushes with, but uh, it's just, it's there. It's, it's part of being an oil painter, I guess. So it doesn't really uh, bother me that much. So now I want to add some super thick paint. I want to really maybe build up this area in here really thick. So I'm going to take some more of that off white, that warm white, and I'm going to add it into this mixture. I'm going to add some wax into it again. So more wax. And this time I'm going to add a little bit of my gel because this is going to thicken up all the paint as well. But I have another little secret here that I like to use that's called marble dust. So how do I figure out how much marble dust? I just kind of wing it. And I'm just going to take some of this white dust. It looks like pastel dust. And I'm going to dump it into my mixture. I'm going to mix that all up. Takes a little bit. But you're going to feel that your paint's going to get really dried out. And what that marble dust is doing is it's absorbing all of the oil in your paint. And once I put this on, I can already tell how thick it's making my paint. You can see how thick and gooey it is. Then I can literally take this layer, whoops, and I can apply this onto my canvas really thickly. And I don't know if you can get like a side angle view so you can see how thick I just applied this. But this, there's no problem using it. this at this stage of the painting. I just know that I want this to be a really, really thick area. So I'm just going to thicken it up. And then I might add some texture to it. Notice how I'm not filling everything in. I'm leaving some of the other color that was behind it in there. So I don't, I don't try to, again, I'm not trying to paint the wall. I'm not trying to cover everything. I'm just kind of playing right now. I don't know exactly what this is gonna turn out to be, which could be very frustrating for people. So this is not a very linear process where you start out, you know where you're gonna be, you're copying a photo, and then next thing you know, you've got your, your image. This is all just constantly questioning yourself, asking those design questions, it's asking if you have the three C's. And that's how I tell myself if I'm done with a painting. Does the composition work? Does the color work? Does the contrast work is there contrast in color in value in texture and so i always want to try to make sure i have like a really loud area like the loud conversation at a party in a quieter area so i try to focus like in the focal point up here i want a lot more action i want the thicker paint i want the biggest and most dramatic value change up there so what i might do right now just wipe this off here switch to a different knife and I might take a little bit of my chromatic black. I'm going to kind of mix it off the edge of these two colors. I don't know if you guys can see what I'm mixing. Nope, I'm out of frame. Here we go. I'm going to grab a little bit of my wax, put it back in there. And now what I want to do with my painting is right where my lightest light is, I'm going to add some of my darkest dark underneath it. So this is a little bit of that blue gray and a little bit of warm white. So this is not just chromatic black on its own, but it is a mixture of all the other colors that I've already been using today. So I wanna make sure I really drive somebody in this composition to that focal point. So my darkest dark and my lightest light are gonna kind of sit across from each other. And then I wanted to also show you guys the powder pigment will make a really thick paint as well. So let me make sure I have you on my palette again. So I'm just gonna dump, this is just some ultramarine blue powdered pigment. I'm just going to take some wax and mix it directly into my powdered pigment. And again, I try to give it a ratio of 50-50. It, it really dries up the wax super quickly. So I'm gonna kind of break up all the little beads from my powdered pigment. I think I need a little bit more wax in here. 
And this works a lot like the marble dust, but it's not as quick drying. So I'm like a very big procrastinator and whenever I have a big painting due for a show, I'm always kind of like waiting till like two days before the show to finish a painting. So I make sure I use a lot of my powdered pigments and my marble dust. I can even put some marble dust in here too, to make sure, especially with my whites and my reds, I can dry them quickly. So just to get this to, to be spreadable more, I'm adding a little bit of that Gelkid gel. And again, this is all just mediums I'm adding to my paint to play with it. I'm gonna add this right around, let's get back to the painting now, right around these dark areas. So now I've got this really nice thick dark blue. And right now it's just ultramarine blue, but it's picking up that last layer and mixing with the green a little bit. I think that looks way cooler. When you're working with cold wax paintings and you're doing this type of process, you really need to work on several paintings at one time, just because you need to let the paint set up a little and dry. So as you're letting those layers dry up, you can start on your next painting, which is fantastic for someone like me because I have a very short attention span. And um, it's great, I work on it for a while, I put it away, I work on another one. And that's one of the reasons why I went and got a studio because I just couldn't work as big as I wanted to in my basement anymore. It worked for as long as it could. I'm just gonna drag some of that down and see what I can do down here. And I can already tell with my gloves on that this is all starting to get tacky and especially up at the top because I put that marble wax in. The marble dust, not marble wax. Um, I also wanted to show you now, let's do a really cool resist on the gesso board so you can see that the oil paper actually absorbs it a little bit more. And that's another substrate I do not like using when I plain air paint because it really sucks all your paint in. And when you're out there, you kind of need it to be a little bit more fluid to move things around. Um, I don't like this crispy edge in here. So I'm gonna take my cheesecloth and just kind of come in and pull out some of that edging. I want some, some nice crispy edges up at the top. I don't always like that little brayer mark showing. So I just like to come in and dab with the cheesecloth and soften up some edges. So now we're gonna do something cool and fun and I'm gonna use my spray bottle and I'm gonna hit this. I just splashed a little bit of paint thinner on it. And just to make sure this works really good for you, I'm gonna grab my orange terpene in my applicator and I'm gonna make sure I hit it on a couple really dark spots. When you're using this uh, method, it, it takes a couple trial and error experiments to make sure you're letting it sit long enough, making sure the humidity is um, proper in your studio. And that's another thing I do to get my paintings to dry super fast. I always have a dehumidifier on in my studio to keep the uh, humidity to about 30%. When I was painting in my basement, I was having a really hard time because nothing would dry like three weeks later and my paintings were still dry, even though I had marble dust and even though I had wax. So I finally went on Gamblin's site and wrote them to find out what am I doing wrong? Why is this stuff not drying? And they said it's the humidity because I was in a basement. So um, I have let this sit for a little bit and there's a couple techniques you can do to remove it. I can lay a paper towel down over it and grab my brayer, which is right here. And I can just rub this across and pick up some of that. And that's not working very good yet. So I probably have to let that sit a little bit longer or I need to squeegee it off. So here's one of those things where you can't rush it. It's gotta sit on here for just a little bit. Oh yeah, now we're getting some cool technique. And this was what we kind of showed you in the video if you got a chance to watch it. And I'm gonna try to zoom in here on it. So there's all these little pieces where you can see that it's just like really small right now, but it's starting to pull that ultramarine blue I put on to show that first layer that was underneath there. So it's, it's pretty small, but I'm getting some cool shapes. And sometimes you have to, to play with it once and then come back again and squeegee again. And yeah, I'm starting to get some really cool fun stuff. And like the texture that I'm building up in here is just starting to look really cool. So that would be kind of like the beginning of something. I have a little bit of, oops, let's go back up. You are not, dang. 
So if I come up a little bit higher, I had a bunch of turp that I threw on here. I can start pulling some of that paint that I just applied. And you see how it's leaving little remnants of it as I, I go along. It's like, oh, it's looking super cool even in here. I'm just tapping a little bit of that paint and I'm getting some really interesting textures. And I think this little area that I put super thick might be a little bit much, but I know that eventually when it dries, I'm gonna come in and really start digging into it to make some really funky textures. So then when I go on another time, it'll build it up even more. Let's add a little bit of a light over here. So now what I'm gonna do, I know I'm throwing everything in the kitchen sink at you, but I just want you to see the versatility of this medium. So now what I can do is I can use pastels. And what I love to use are my pan pastels. And they're so fun because they're very low dust. It's kind of like using the powdered pigment, but I literally just take the applicator that comes with them and in a nice dried spot, I can just take and press that pan pastel into it. What I do is I put it in, and since I have a wet layer of wax, it should sit right on the top of it. Let me make sure you can see that. And I'm pulling in that same color that I had up in the top of the painting. Let's get that lighting a little bit better. Oops, I turned the light down. So if I, again, just pick up some of that pan pastel, I can build it up and start glazing some colors right now just to kind of jazz this painting up. I can make little marks with this little sponge and just kind of play with it. So now I'm kind of bouncing the same color and I'm just tapping it in and there should be enough wax from that first layer to stick to it. And if I feel like it's lifting off, then I would just come in when this is dry and put a thin layer of just wax straight up on its own, let it sit for about a day, a good 24 hours, and then I can come back on top and work with it. At the same time, I can also come back in into this painting and start drawing with my charcoal. It will pick up the wax that's on here and it will seal itself. So it's like doing a mixed media painting, but with oil. Anything you could ever think of doing in the past with mixed media and acrylics, you can do with this. And I like using oil pastels. I have a whole set of oil pastels out here. Now, the only thing I'll warn you about, if you use an oil pastel, it has a different binder in it and it takes a very long time to dry. So you just need to remember, if you decide to use some oil pastels, you're gonna have to give it a little bit more drying time before you do another layer of paint on top of it. But I could come right in and just start drawing in with this nice kind of lavender gray um, oil pastel and start making some marks and drawing in and through and around things. That will also be cool when I come back in again and start painting with it again. I may take some cheesecloth or a little paper towel and just dab some of that out because I got an awful lot of that oil pastel on here. And the last technique that I'm going to show you is the thing that sold me on cold wax the first time I did it. But um, I used to be what I considered a mixed media artist and I was in the National Collage Society and the Midwest Collage Society, even though I didn't really do a lot of collage, I always had collage somewhere in my paintings. But you can collage with your cold wax. So I have a painting going, right? I, this is not like I, I planned it out and I did some collage in the very beginning of my painting. This is well underway, but I'm just gonna take this little piece of paper and I'm just gonna kind of tear it as close to the, the shape as I can. And that's good enough for me. So this is my technique. It's really, really complex. I literally take my finger with some wax and let me see where I might want to put this. I don't know. Let's put it in the middle of some craziness. So I'm going to press some wax in here. I'm going to press my piece of paper down and then using my gloves, I'm just going to press that piece of wax back down into the painting. So I'm sealing it with the wax. It's the same thing you would do with a gel medium or anything like that. And I like the fact that I'm picking up some of that paint because now I'm just kind of grounding it right in. So it's not going to be as obvious that I cut and tore a piece of paper and stuck it in my painting. So that is my complex technique for adding collage. I just do it with my gloves. 
My gloves are my tools as much as my brushes are. So I can then come in again with my handy little piece of cheesecloth and I can make sure I have it pressed down. I can pull some of that paint out. I can come in with one of my squeegees and I can like really make sure it's nice and flattened in there. But I can also unify it with the rest of the painting by just pulling again across some of the edges of that paper, some of that paint into it. And then it becomes another layer of my painting. And I think that's pretty cool. I love adding collage in my paintings. So there's no need to pre-plan this and glue your paper with gesso beforehand. You can actually just do it as you go with your cold wax. So because I think that's, you know, not that cool having one little piece of paper, I'm gonna always add three little pieces somewhere. So I'm gonna take this little piece and rip it in half. And I think coming off this little square shape that I have, I'm going to again glue another piece of paper in. And I'm just going to press it down. And then I might rip this one even smaller. So I have a big piece, a medium piece, and a small piece. And uh, because I want people to look up at this focal point, I think I might just kind of float it over this little piece of charcoal I put down here. So again, I didn't have a, a real set plan. I'm just kind of feeling it. I'm going with the feel of the painting at this point. I just pressed that down really hard and now I got some cool little elements that I might want to stick in a little bit better. So here's my papers and I'm just gonna grab a tiny knife and just maybe take a little bit of that powdered pigment and wax and just cover into this knowing that I can draw into this. If my edge is sticking up, which I see a little bit of an edge sticking up, I'm going to take this knife and just go underneath the paper and press it down. May really make sure I burnish it really well. If it picks up on you a little bit, like the next day, you just put a little bit more wax on it and it, and it will stick. I've, I've glued just about everything you can imagine to, um, to any of my paintings. So I have all kinds of different things in all of them. So the last thing I'm gonna do on this one, and again, I'm probably working this a little bit more than I normally would, but I'm gonna add some drip effect in here. And I'm gonna mix that up on my palette by using some of this uh, Galkid medium with a little bit of wax and some paint. So I'm gonna do it with what I have left over. And remember this had everything in the kitchen sink in it. Uh, are we on? I'm having a hard time seeing what I'm on here. Here, there we go. I'm going to take a lot of this Galkid medium. And I'm going to really thin this out. So we know this mixture has a little bit of wax, has some marble dust, it has a lot of Galkid medium in it right now. So it's getting really shiny. This will dry to a nice crispy shine. And this, again, aids in the speed of the drying time. But I'm going to also take a brush and dip it in some Gamsol, and I'm going to thin it out. What I can do is create a drip with this, this nice thick, thin mixture that will actually leave a droplet. It won't just dissipate into the rest of the painting. So I'm going to have to stick the painting up, and now I'm going to come back to the painting. Sorry, I hope I'm not jostling this around on you guys too much. It's my first time doing Zoom, so I don't know if this little stand I have is cutting it, but... I'm going to try to get it so it's a little bit more steady. All right. I think we're good. So I'm going to take this and I just, I, I do it by feel. If I, I feel like it's got enough, what I could do is come under this little element here and start popping some of this down with the Galkid medium. And I'm going to put enough on it so it'll run. And of course, I don't have enough mixture in it. So I'm going to hit a little bit more, a little bit more. And, and what you'll notice from when I just like sprayed just the Gamsol is it's going to leave that mark. It's not just going to fade out into the rest of the painting and look, uh, you know, like I just didn't have a good application of paint. It's actually going to leave a more deliberate mark on the painting. And don't worry about all this. I don't like it. So we'll just again grab the cheesecloth. And I'll start dabbing some of that out. So I see a little bit of these lines that are coming down. I might tap them on the table to get them to, to
to bleed out a little bit more. But what I might want to do is get rid of some of them. Is it too much? Probably. And then I could just come in and dab some of it out, wipe some of them away. I have a lot of flexibility at this point in this painting to do a lot of different things to it. So I've got a lot of different things happening here. I can grab a little bit of my turquoise again if I wanted to in this spot and kind of play with some of that brighter color. So this, this was starting to get a little bit insane, wasn't it? And I can kind of pull this brayer through and look at that really fun base texture I'm making. I'm just gonna look at what shapes are happening, maybe cover this up just a little bit more, pull this up through the top. I like to make some little marks, some lines. Karen, yes. Can you move the camera a little bit to the left? Change left. There you go. Oh, oh, that's great. Oops. Okay. Sorry yeah, about that, gang. That's great. Okay. <laughs> so I'm starting to get, you know, some really kind of fun little marks in here, but I wouldn't want to overdo it right now because, like I said, we should let this sit and rest and then come back and attack it again in like a day and see what we have. So um, I'm going to put this aside for just a minute. And I'm going to come back to the first one I was working on. And I'm just going to kind of touch it. And I can feel it's already getting tacky and it's already setting up. So if I wanted to come in and add some collage, play with some oil pastels, powder pigment, any of those different things, I could come in at this time if I wanted to. I could do a resist. And this one might be fun. I just love popping in a nice neutral oil pastel. And just look how pretty that looks against that orange. And I could just start drawing in if I wanted to. So it's going to pull away some of it. And it's also going to apply. So you can never really tell what you're going to get. And that's why I absolutely love it. So I just like to work with, with the paint and kind of let it make itself. I like to uh, many times come in with a knife, just using an edge of a knife, and again, kind of scratching in to kind of soften up some edges. Kind of put a little bit of thicker paint right in here. I have some leftover paint from both of the paintings. I'm kind of reusing things. Pop a little bit of a darker, thicker mark in here. And now I've got this really thin leftover blue that I was dripping. And, and how pretty is that going to look up in here in the sky area? But I love leaving some of the drawing showing through. I like to show the history of the layers as they keep evolving. Now, some of my paintings might only have two layers. Some of them might have up to 40 layers of paint. And the thicker I make it and the more layers I add, the more I can come back in and then eliminate some by scratching and digging into the paint to reveal what was underneath. There's been a lot of times I've had finished paintings that were done for like a year, won some awards at a show and I just didn't like it. So I just went right in and went back at it again until I was happy with it. So it's a really forgiving thing. And yes, I know I'm showing you just abstract stuff, but this same technique would work if you were painting a landscape or if you were doing a portrait or anything that you were working on. If you wanted to add some thickness to your leaves in, in a painting, you could mix up some wax so you get a really nice, super thick impasto that's gonna dry on you and not be wet and make a big mess. So we could just kind of play with this, pull some of this back in. And that's kind of like the start, these two paintings of how I would work an oil and cold wax painting. So I don't know if you guys want to do some questions really quick. And then if you would like, we could do a little project together. And hopefully you guys are down for that. I've got yet another one to work with so I can help talk you guys through one more painting. And I don't know, um, Jeff, do we want to open it up in case anybody wants to ask a question? Yeah, if anyone wants to ask a question, just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask the question. No questions. That's either very good or very bad. <laughs> hey, Karen, I got a question. Okay. Um, when you're working on the masonite, are you adhering that to, you know, to the, the papers, to that first, or how is that happening with the um, masonite? You can buy that. Raymar actually sells board that mm -hmm. is, um, already has the oil paper on it. 
So right. sometimes I buy that, but if I'm just using the paper because I'm cheap, yeah. and um, like right now I'm just working on this one painting on just a piece of paper, what I would do is I have a plain board, just a cheap board you can buy it like yeah. through Michaels. I spray painted it and then I would take it and I would just use yes paste and I would glue it to this board. Okay. So I could glue it after the painting was done. All right. Or you could take these and frame them. Like if you wanted to take this and, and actually put it in a traditional frame, you can do that too. But this is a really fun way to practice and play with this medium. See if you like it and you're not spending a lot of money on expensive gesso boards and those Raymar boards are pretty pricey too. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. So this is just a really good way to practice. And what I, they do sell them like in those pads where it's like a nine by 12 or 12 by 16. Right. And then you can just take them, tape them off. Like I have this little one here. And then you can just do multiple little studies with it just so you learn the tools. And is that too much um, wax? Do I feel like that's not enough wax? And you can just really play with this medium. And I can't stress enough that you have to just like have fun with it. And until you do a ton of it, you're not gonna really understand its limitations or the possibilities you can do. And um, it's like anything else, like you just have to do it a million times. And I know that probably sounds daunting, but it's whether you're drawing, oh, no, sketching, like doing art. anything. <laughs> you, you have to do just a ton of it. And so a really great way is just getting some of this oil paper. And who cares if you don't like it then? It's just a piece of paper. Oh yeah, I don't, yeah, I know. I just was talking about adhering it. If you ever, you know, you use some of your glue or what, you know. Yeah, yes paste, which is the cheapest paste you can ever buy. And I would just yeah. put this on yeah. the back. And here is one that's, this is how they call them. I actually brought this to show you guys. So this is just a, a board, an unfinished board from Dick Blick. It's just like their Blick studio boards, really cheap. And of course now I've got this all nasty because I've been like grabbing it with my gloves. But this I spray painted. And then if I wanted to, I could literally, I just made sure this was a six by six size. I could just put it on here and then I've got a nice, you know, gallery yeah. wrap edge ready, on it. And you just bank, glue yeah. it down with, with wet, uh, the yes paste. And then you just stick like a bag of rice on top of it. Mm. And how yeah. would I finish it then is I would take just a little bit of wax, like on my hand, I would rub a coat of it into the painting. Let it sit for 24 hours and then I would buff it like with an old t-shirt or with old pantyhose. Who has okay. those anymore? But if you have pantyhose, yeah. that's the best thing to buff with. And then, you know, you don't need to oil out your painting. You don't need to varnish your painting because the wax is your varnish. That's what's, yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you can do that with any painting. Even if you just, even if you take nothing from this demo, and you don't like varnish like I don't. Even the matte varnishes, I still think, put this yeah, weird kind of varnish. slimy shine on my paintings. So even if you do nothing else, you can just apply cold wax, let it dry for 24 hours at least, and then you buff it to the shine that you want. The more you buff it, the more you might pull back the shine, but it's gonna be the kind of shine that when you go to take a photograph, you're still gonna be able to see your painting. Good. <laughs> it's not gonna give you that horrible glare that's impossible yeah. to get rid of. All right. Okay. So, awesome. Any other, thank you for asking a question. That was a very good question. <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> Anybody else? Karen? Yes. Can you use that on a watercolor as well to finish it so you don't have to put it under glass? I do not know because I've never, I'm not a watercolor person and watercolor kind of terrifies me. So I have never tried it. Um, you would have to experiment. Um, I might even try that now that you asked, I'll pull out some watercolors and test it out and I can get back to you guys. I'll write back to you guys um, at the guild and let you know, but I've never tried it. It's, it, it's a, it's a medium for oil and Yes, you can use it on top of an acrylic painting. I would not mix it with acrylic paint, but as just a varnish on the top. So I, I'm really not sure, but I'm glad you asked that and I will find out. I'll get you an answer to that question. Thank you. Hey, Karen. Yes. Are, are these as permanent as, uh, as just straight oil paints or is there any problem with uh, fading or any issues like that with this stuff? There's no fading. 
There's no problem with temperature. I've had them in windows. I've had them in my hot car. It doesn't melt, nothing happens. But what you're doing is if you add these mediums, like if you add some cold wax and some Galkid or that gel, you're creating an even stronger paint film so that all those layers of paint, even if you have a little bit of wax in every layer, it's gonna like mix better with the layer that was underneath and you're gonna have a really strong bond of the paint. Now, if I'm using a big board, or just a plain wooden board like this, I will coat it with Gamblin's ground for oil paint. And this is different than regular gesso because regular gesso is acrylic based. So this is an oil based product and it's very slick. So it makes a very hard surface and uh, some people might not like painting on it because it's super slick, but if I'm using brayers and all these weird unconventional tools, I want a slick surface. I don't want a, a, a canvas texture on it that I'm gonna fight the whole time. So, um, but that is the best way to get started with an oil painting. If you're thinking about conservation and it lasting for 150 years, I would suggest gambling paint, use ground for oil, and then every step of your painting, if you can, add a little bit of medium into it. And that will just really ensure that you're not gonna run into any problems. And I've never, ever had a problem with fading yet. So I've only been using the cold wax for about seven years now. So, um, so far so good, I love it. It's kind of indestructible. Anybody else have any questions? All this right. Is Dale. I apologize for um, logging in late. I had trouble with my computer. But, okay. Um, I'm wondering if you need to take a break to get yourself organized for the group painting and if you might just um, remind people what they need. Okay. Um, I don't need to take a break. I have everything here, but I will remind you guys now, if you have some wax, pull out a nice little dab of wax. You don't need a lot of paint because remember the wax is going to be 50-50 mixed. So I would grab a white, a black, and one color just to play with for this first time. Keeping it really simple. So we're just going to play with value. We're going to play with mixing the paint. If you have some toothpicks or some kebabs, like those shish kebabs, that's good for scraping into. Um, a brush, a knife. Um, if you wanna try sticking some paper into it, you can. Um, if you have any kind of squeegees, even if you have an old credit card, that will work too. So it's just kind of one of those things that anything you got laying around your studio, we can try and put it into this little painting. So if, if everybody wants to gather some of their stuff, what I'm going to do is mix up some more paint, I guess, and I'll kind of explain the mixtures as I'm going, but I kind of ran out of paint. So I'm going to clean up my palette really quick and I'm going to play with some asphaltum, which is one of my favorite gambling colors. And that's a really nice kind of earthy brown. So since I'm going to think landscape, so I'm going to think abstract landscape, horizon line, maybe some, you know, dips in the in, in the in the the distance because I want to make sure you guys can achieve some depth in this painting but I think it's most important on your first one you're not so worried about what you're painting you're just literally playing with the with the tools and with the wax um so Karen? I'll go ahead and start mixing up and Karen, if you guys want to get your Karen I'm sorry it's Gail yeah I was going to ask you to back out so we can see you mix thanks okay yeah so I'm gonna come in here, I think I'm on my palette, and yeah, I'm gonna to go to town. I'm gonna to clean it first because this is a mess. I usually never throw away any leftover paint, but you, can you guys see this, how it's already crusty and like drying on my, on my palette just from me mixing and working with you guys now. So that shows you how quickly using these different mediums in the wax will dry. So again, great for someone like me who has a very um, short attention span and procrastinates. It's um, the perfect tool, but you can see how I'm just kind of, it's not like regular paint. It's definitely uh, 
sticking in. This is a glass palette that I use. Um, I just like it better. I also like to use these little um, Japanese scrapers because then I can really clean my palette really fast and it's, it's a lot easier than using a regular palette knife. And this is just like a spatula for decorating cakes that I use. So a lot of my tools that I use are literally from the kitchen store. So I go to um, at home or any of those kind of places and I just walk the aisles and I look for some silicone tools that might be kind of cool because you don't need to spend a lot of money to get really cool, interesting, fun effects. You can just, you know, use what you have, try some stuff out and you're either going to like it or you're not. So it's, there's kind of no real in between. All right, that's good enough for me. So I'm going to take some of my asphaltum, pull it right off the deck here. And this is just like a really nice earthy dark brown. And I just really like to make sure when I'm mixing it that I'm getting all of the wax kind of mixed into all of the paint. So I, I probably mix it a lot more than I ever would if I was just mixing colors on my palette. I just want to make sure I'm not going to get any lumps or bumps from the wax. It does dry, you know, completely clear, like I said, so it's good for a varnish. So what I'm going to do is kind of pull some of this over here. And then I'm going to take some of my cobalt teal and mix in with the asphaltum. And because I added a little bit more paint, I'm going to add a little bit more wax. And I've done it so much now that I can tell by the feel of it if I've got it like at the right consistency. I'm going to make just a kind of cool green and then off the edge of it, I'm going to mix some of my warm white. So now I've got three values at least. And I think as long as you have, you know, a light, medium, and a dark, um, maybe a variation of each color. If I want to add a little bit of the chromatic black to it, I can. And especially when you're adding your white, don't forget to pick up a little bit of wax and kind of add that in there. I'm going to take this white, just put it over here. You can use any white though. Any white works if you just have regular um, titanium white, if you have um, radiant white. I just happen to, to like using a warm white. Sometimes I think it just makes it too chalky if I use um, a regular white. So it's all just, you know, just preference. I might grab some of my chromatic black now over here and kind of mix it up. And again, I've got that kind of really interesting orange background. So knowing that these colors should play really nice with it. And look at how nice this is looking here. This nice, it's like my oil pastel that I have. Just making a nice kind of neutral gray. And that's one of the things that I always kind of strive for in my paintings to make sure the little bit of color that I might use really pops. I want to make sure I have some neutrals made out of those colors. I'm going to try to make sure, you know, do I have a nice temperature mix? Do I have some cools? Do I have warm? So again, that's one of those three C's. Do I have contrast and temperature, texture? So I think that's like enough for me to get started. I might add a little bit of gel into it. And if you don't have any gel, don't worry about it. You don't need to add it in. You can work with it just with wax. And I think I'm good to go. Like this super thin. The more wax you add, the thinner your paint will be, and you'll be able to make a really super thin film if you wanted to. But the interesting thing about adding wax to your paint is it creates transparency. So even if I have a really opaque color, like a white or something that's super, super opaque, if I add wax to it, I'll make it transparent. And that's something I think a lot of people overlook when they're using their oil paints. They're not paying attention to if it's transparent or opaque. So what I try to do when I'm working with it is in my layers, as I'm working on these, I'll do one layer with transparent paints and then one layer with opaque paints. Because then as you look through the painting, when it's done, you'll see the depth in the layers. So a lot of times people will ask me, well, I don't see any depth in your painting. And I'm like, you have to look through the layers 
to see all that subtle history. And so you almost get an encaustic like look with just using this cold wax medium. Um, another thing people will ask me all the time is, will this last for a couple days? Um, I might leave this out till tomorrow if I know I'm going to come back and paint and I can still use the wax, but any more than that, I would just throw it away or I would put it back in my can. So um, cold wax usually always comes in a can. You would just seal it back in there um, or at least put it in some kind of a airtight jar and you can save it. The paint that I have that's left over, same thing. It will dry relatively quickly. So if I have leftover paint at an end of a session, I just like to take it and make a first layer on a new painting. So I never try to waste it or um, I'll just grab it and just mush it on something else. So I don't have a lot of waste when it comes to oil and cold wax, which is really nice. So if everybody is ready to go, I'm gonna kinda, you can check out the little palette I mixed up. Oops. Get all my tools kind of dried off and cleaned up here. And let's kind of bring this back up so we can see both the palette and the painting. Get rid of these paper towels. My favorite brushes, just so I can like, um, kind of give them a little shout out. I love Rosemary and Company brushes. And these are really nice because they're pretty smooth, but yet they're very stiff. So they're great for adding texture. Sometimes I use vegetable scrubbers. Like literally anything I can get my hand on that will make a cool texture on my painting, I will try it out. So what you guys want to do in order to, to test this out is um, you just want to kind of visualize a little bit of where do you want your uh, horizon line to be. So kind of in the last two, I did a little bit of a high horizon line in these. So I'm gonna do like a low one. So I'm gonna have like a big sky type of a painting. So I'm gonna start by just coming in. I think first I would like you guys to try applying this with if you have a squeegee or a brayer, I want you to try all the different tools. So that way, if you have specific questions about them when you're trying this, you can ask me while I'm live with you. But I really like my little um, rectangle shaped palette knife. So I'm gonna start, since it's kind of a small painting, I'm gonna start and I'm gonna take some of my nice dark, dark, my asphaltum, and I'm gonna put it down. And it's a nice color with that wax. It makes a really nice transparency. So I can just apply some of the paint. And even if I wanted to take my brush, I could come in here now and start brushing it down and makes, oh, let me come up a little bit more, a really nice warm coloration. I, I really like this. So I don't want to make it too even again. We're not like, you know, traditionally painting anything. We're just kind of blocking in some color. And uh, if I wanted to, I could dry this brush off. And now I just kind of have a, a dried off brush, but I can, you know, I might want to add some of it up in here because I might want to give myself a big tree. But before I commit to it, I'm just going to kind of press it in and just see kind of like, uh, what do I want to do with it? So I can even take some of that paint and start pulling it up. So I'm, I might be creating, you know, some, some marks for where my trunk might be. And I hope that's clear enough so you guys can see the actual value changes that it's making. So I just have that as a start. That's something for me to hold on to. I can use my cheesecloth now. And if I wanted to remove some of this, I could come in, press kind of hard and start pulling some of that away. I can dab some of it off so I leave some texture. It's nice and thin, so it'll, it should dry relatively quickly, but I wanna leave some of that really nice orange peeking through. So that's gonna be kind of the underbelly, like the, the wash of my painting. If you didn't have that before you started, it doesn't matter. I just did it for you guys so you could see like kind of what a second layer of paint would look like without me having one completely wet layer for you guys. So then I'm gonna start kind of up with the sky and I'm gonna use a different tool. So a lot of times when I'm painting, 
If I start needling in too much with the same thing, I say, stop, change tools, pick up a different tool and make a different kind of mark. We don't want everything to be the same. We want variety. We want big marks. We want small marks. Um, I have, you know, a big brush here. I've got like three brush sizes because I want to make sure that every time I come in, I'm making something interesting. So again, I'm going to load this little brayer with some paint, but I'm not going to, you know, roll it the whole way. I'm just putting it on a little bit of it. So when I come on here and I kind of pull across the front, it's going to make a very randomized, uneven uh, application of paint. Maybe I'm going to come down here and pull a little bit in here too. So I'm just going to look at that. Um, again, I can take my brush if I just kind of wipe some of that darker paint off of it really quick. And I can kind of push some of it around and I can pull some of the orange back through if I want to. It's just about softening and crispening things up. If I want, I can use this brush now. I'm just going to keep showing you different techniques. And I might go ahead and make it a little bit lighter here at the horizon line. So I'm going to pull some of that lighter color. It's just pretty much warm white, but it's picking up some of that transparent orange that was underneath. So it's, even though I'm direct painting just with that uh, off white, it, it doesn't look like it because I'm showing the, the different layers through it. Can add some interest up in the sky. put a little bit of the thicker kind of blue green. So I'm having a blue green sky. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do. So I just, you know, randomly pick some colors to play with today. But if you've never tried, um, you know, this asphaltum, it's a really cool color. I really like, like that. Instead of using a burnt sienna or a burnt umber, it's just a really nice, nice color. So I'm gonna stop tool. See, I'm dinking around too much with the same tool. So I'm gonna pick a different knife up and I'm gonna start putting some of that really intense, more pure color into this. Let's make sure we got this up here. So my tree shape, I can use a little bit thicker paint if I want to. Start kind of moving that around. Maybe I have some crazy bushes in here. Add some little darks into it. But then I feel like I want to pick up my brayer and let's see what we can do if we start smooshing around some paint or pulling some paint in. So what I can do now is I can use this and I can pull it down, kind of soften up some of the paint, but I can also make some cool marks with this brayer so it looks like we have a little bit of maybe like a path or some dips in, in the grass. We have some foliage. I might uh, soften up the edge up here, pull this in. Thinking about, you know, when, when you're doing a landscape, of course we want like the warmest, colors up in the front so that's why I'm trying to keep some of that brown in there because I want it to have a little bit more dark but I also want maybe I'll pull some little horizon uh, horizontal lines in here so maybe it will look like you've got little pieces of grass and now I'm going to take a different tool yet again I'm going to take a brush again and I'm going to come in and I'm going to take this nice grayed down color and I'm going to start adding it back here right along this line. I added some of my medium to it so it's a little bit thicker. It's a little bit easier to apply. And, and I kind of want that back here. I want to kind of gray some of that down. Maybe add some of that into the sky. So see, I can paint with it just like I'm painting a, a regular painting. So you can paint with it. It's a misconception that you have to use weird tools and paint thick and you can't glaze, you know, but I just have an ability to really work the paint. I almost feel like I'm doing a pastel as I'm doing this because you have um, so many possibilities for your mark making. And I just did it again. I just painted the bottom of my painting. Don't do that if, that, <laughs> if your eyes are working. 
be mindful of that. So I'm going to put a little bit more of this, kind of lose the edge into my tree. And I'm going to stop and pick up a different tool. I'm pulling some dark into it and uh, I can come back and put my light back on the top. Take my squeegee again and now I can kind of just remove some of this. There comes a point when you're going to feel like just like in any oil painting, I'm like overworking this. I need to stop. And then you know what? Then you just take a break, stop and let it dry for a little while. Come back to it. But again, this is about playing with those tools and seeing how can you soften an edge? How can you make a couple of cool little marks in here? Like, oh, I don't know why, but I really like what I just did there. Um, I don't want this tree to look like it's a lollipop. So I'm gonna come in and, and play with that. So again, cheesecloth or paper towel. I'll do paper towel this time. So I'm gonna come in and dab some of that out. I want some lost edges in here. And maybe I'm gonna pull my little tree line up and make it bigger because I don't like just having one tree hanging out. So this is gonna become some randomized tree line. I'm just dabbing the brush straight up and down and carve into it a little bit. Pull a couple little sky holes through. I don't like that little fuzz in there. But I think I need some more color. So let's add a little bit more color. One of the first times I ever used cold wax medium, I really hated what I was working on. I was so frustrated because I didn't kind of know where I was going. So I literally sprayed the whole thing down with um, paint thinner and scraped it off. And I was like, oh my God, this is the coolest painting I've ever made. So you have the ability at any point to obliterate something that you don't like on this. There is a lot of freedom, but for a lot of people, it is frustrating because everybody is so used to having, you know, a, a more linear path to creating a painting. And this is very cyclical. Like I come back in and then I'm going to carve something out and then I can come back in and re-add a layer. I can scratch something in. Um, so I'm just going to keep playing with it. And that's kind of the fun of it, I really think, but not, it's not going to be for everybody. And then, you know, of course, that's when I would encourage you to figure out your own way of applying it to your particular style. Doesn't have to be the way I like to do it. You know, everyone's going to be a little bit different. But it's just, it's really fun at this point just to see what you can do just with those three values and, and just keep playing with it. And because it dries so fast and because you can pull it in so quickly, um, it really leaves a lot of room to experiment. And that's what I want you to do, just to have fun and experiment with something new. You know, I think everybody gets really comfortable with the same old thing. So this is like just a great way to just keep playing. Now I'm gonna hit a little bit of thicker paint because I feel like I want something a little bit lighter in here. Maybe that's a little further back tree line. Let's put a little bit more gray into it. Maybe it just becomes a schmear. And if I wanna show a little bit of depth, maybe I put a little bit of a dark here and then put some of this green back on top. Oh. And I'm going to put this flat for a second so I can kind of look at it. Um, do I paint typically on an easel or flat? Most of the time I paint on the wall of my studio. I, um, I have little cleats up everywhere and all of my panels and stuff will have cleats on the back so I can move them around to any height and that way I can keep moving 
paintings to keep going with them. But um, sometimes it is good to work flat like I am right now on the table because you can press a lot harder and kind of control what you're doing. So if you have your little toothpick, this might be a kind of fun time to come in and start pulling out some little shapes. You can pull in some texture, maybe, you know, if I really want this to look a little bit more like a realistic painting, I could pull out a couple little random trunks, use the side of it to scrape paint out. Just make sure you keep wiping it so you don't have uh, a mess on your hands. And you can just, you know, keep working with this. I just feel like I need something a little bit more intense. So I'm just going to mix a little bit of that cobalt teal straight into my big mixture of white. Get a little bit of a brighter color in here because it's looking a little boring. So using the same colors that I originally started with, I'm just going to add a little something else, a little funner. A little bit more color in a couple spots just like three little spots i just want to kick a little bit of a brighter color and it's getting muddy i can tell already so i feel like this would be a good spot for me to stop and hold off for a minute let it dry up and then come back in and, and reattack it with another layer of paint and like i said this is layer two of this painting and it might wind up being a completely different subject a completely different color scheme when i'm done this is just the very beginning of of what it might be and what i'll do is um i will send jeff these paintings maybe maybe i'll work on them one more time tomorrow just to show you guys and um i can give you like an update about here it is with one more session put into it so you can kind of see how it evolves a little bit slower than you might think. It's it. I very rarely ever do one painting and just one sitting and here you go. Sometimes it turns out that way, but typically I come back in several times and just keep adding thickness and you know just just working it, playing with it. I haven't done any of the um, the resist. So why don't I do that again, just so you guys can see that one more time. I'm going to use my bowl scraper again, and I'm just going to pull out the bottom here because it's just, I don't like it. Liking it better already, doing some weird stuff. Too much paint, I think. I'm just going to thin some of it out. And I love using these because I love how it moves the paint, but I don't always like the big crispy line. So that's why I like that it's got the little curved edge on it because I could kind of come in and use that as a tool to smooth out my paint as well. Anything that looks muddy or, or not, you know, a nice application of paint, I will come back in and, you know, put a little bit of a, a thicker amount to kind of let that set up so it doesn't look as muddy or messy. So I'm going to do a little bit of the um, orange terpene in here. Or if you guys don't have it, you know what, I'm just going to use my, um, I'm just going to use regular Gamsol just like you would have right now. So I'm just going to take a brush, wipe it off really good, put it in my paint thinner. And I'm just going to take that and I'm just gonna kind of dab the brush down here and I'm just gonna let it set for a few minutes. And I'm gonna wipe it out and see what I get. Some of this will be a lot more fun to play with once it's dried. I take sometimes um, scraping tools that you would use for sculpture, clay, stuff like that, and I can scrape back through all the layers. And I think, um, I think Jeff showed one in the video the other day where I had like just massive amounts of paint and I just came in and just was gouging down through probably like maybe 20 layers of paint. So anything is possible with these. I'm going to see how that is going right now. Oh yeah, see how fun? See how I've got those orange spots in there? Now it's starting to look cool. Now it's looking like a, an abstract painting because it takes it away from being, here's a landscape and, and starts making it more unique. 
Karen, can you move your camera a little bit to the left? How's that? So see how up in here in the sky I was able to get, it was just, it just like eats away the top layer of paint. And that's just regular Gamsol. That's not the orange terpene. And down here at the bottom, it just pulled that paint that I was just putting on and is showing that first layer of paint that I had. So that's where it becomes fun. If I came in tomorrow and put another coat of like, let's say a lighter paint, I can do that again and again, eat through the paint and make just really unique dyma dynamic textures that are very, um, you know, just random. And, and, and that's what I like. I can come in with my small brush if I wanted to put some marks in. My big sky is starting to get smaller and smaller, isn't it? <laughs> it's supposed to be really low and it just keeps moving up, but that's all right. I can always pull it back in. Just kind of put a little bit of a broken line that I can kind of blend down. Use my toothpick again. You like little tiny details, you can scratch right into the paint, make little tiny marks. So what I wanna make sure you guys get out of this little demo is I wanna make sure you use some super thin paint just to get like a nice transparent wash. I would like to make sure you use some thick paint so you can really see the usefulness of the wax to build up the thickness. And I just want you to try a couple of those different tools that you have here. And that's enough to get you started on a journey with cold wax. Again, I would definitely do a second, third, fourth, fifth coat and just keep working these guys. And if you guys do that and you have any questions or you want to show me and get a little bit of some advice or some critique, I'd be happy to do that for you guys too. Give you some ideas on where you can go with it. Um, once it's done, again, you can use some pan pastels. If you have past, if you're a pastel artist and you have the dust from your pastels, save it, mix it with wax, use it in your oil paintings. So you know, why why not upcycle everything in your studio? Mm. So how's everybody doing now? Oh, and the best part of this, I'm just going to, I'm going to stop on this one for now, unless you guys want to see any specific technique. But the best thing about having this tape, and I like using the black tape, it's black gaffer's tape. The best part ever is when you pull the tape off. This is the big reveal when you can see how cool your little painting looks. If you don't like the rough edges that were taped off, you can use an X-Acto blade and cut it to a specific size. But sometimes I think that's just the coolest thing is having the little rough edge. And if I wanted to, I could just, you know, smear this edge a little bit so it kind of blends into that orange background I had, just so it doesn't look so taped off. And then you've got the cutest little study, a start of a little painting. But I like to use black tape versus the blue tape because the blue tape, the color just throws me off every time. It just upsets me. So <laughs> I either use white tape or black tape and I use the gaffer's tape because it sticks really well and it never rips. And um, I'm just gonna kind of pull some of that color back. But um, when I show you, I mean, yes, I was doing a tiny, tiny little painting here just for a demo. So I wouldn't take up all of the time doing this, but um, I used hardly any paint that I mixed up. If I swing back over here to my palette, I still have a ton of paint. So that's kind of the cool thing. You don't need to mix up a lot unless you're doing a gigantic painting. So just to use something small, you're going to love it because you're not using all of your oil paint. So here we go so far tonight. Um, 
I might be able to do another little something on this guy. So while you guys are working, I might take a little bit more of this kind of gray color and just kind of pull that in. Oh yeah, I like that much better. So it dries relatively quickly. So even if you just let it set up for a little bit, you come right back in and you can keep playing. Put some of this in here. I might not like all that orange that's showing through, so I may just kind of use a squeegee or something. Oh, let's use the brayer. I like to use this. It's one of my favorite tools because it gives me such an unpredictable line. And if you press hard with it, you can get a different mark. You can draw little lines through it. But um, again, the best thing is taking that cheesecloth and just dabbing in your edges so you kind of soften them up. So I think that's starting to look a little bit better already. And so that would, I would consider that literally my third coat of paint on this guy, which is a bit faster than I typically work on it. But um, I'm going to pull a little bit of that dark back in. Any type of oil paint works for this. Um, Gamblin is my preferred brand, but um, you know, doesn't have to be. As far as the wax goes, I've never used anything but Gamblin, so I don't have much experience with any other brand. But I, I, you know, I'm on some cold wax groups and stuff, and everybody says it works well. Some people make their own, but that's not my thing. I don't want to make my own stuff. I'll upcycle stuff, but I don't want to be making my own wax. It just sounds horrible. So coming back into this one, I might soften up some of these edges back here in the distance. So I can add a little variety, a little bit of a value change. And that might be a whole layer for me, it might just be coming in and just popping the slightest little bit of paint and then letting it set up for a bit. I have way too many little hard edges in here and I don't want that. I want it to look a little more organic. So I'm just gonna come in with this brush. The, the, the wax is real sticky for me now. So it's easy to kind of soften things up. If I went a little too far with that light, I'm just gonna push it back in with a little bit more green. Take a little bit of that gray. I might even take a brush and thin down some of my paint and do a little splat on it. Boom, there you go. And it's just like with any painting, look for crispy edges, soft edges, temperature, contrast, you know, all those different design principles. You're just gonna keep drilling yourself with them until you feel like, you know what, I think this painting is good enough. It'll do, and you can sign it and move on to the next one. So beautiful. That's beautiful. Thanks. And again, if you that. if you loved it, you would take it and you would mount it to a little board, put a little wax varnish on it, and you'd be good to go. I love it. Thank you. Gorgeous. So in, in, in one little time span, I've got, you know, the makings of three little paintings, you know? So where will they go? I don't know. Like this one, I'm not sure. I just wanted to show you everything in the kitchen sink so you can say, I saw that once. <laughs> you know what you Maybe should you call that one? Maybe you can people make these. What? Yeah, you should call this one the big one. Yeah. Teapot. Oh! Right up in here, right? Right on the top, yeah. That's so awesome. <laughs> bring the top, bring the painting top there. 
That does. It's so cool. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That's one of those things. It just kind of like, oh, all right, well, there you go. <laughs> it just started as shapes, and who knows what's going to happen with it. Love it. Cool. Yeah, right. so, you know. Uh, well, are you going to put the rest of your paint on a new one now? Yeah, I probably will. I'm going to, I got this, this canvas sitting right here, so I'm going to go on with just another one. So you, so you use it while it's wet? Yeah. So I'm just going to come here. This is um, a Raymar board, a nice big one. So this is kind of how I would start a new big painting. I like my little roller, so I'm going to come in here and I'm going to grab some of that darkest Voltum and I'm just going to start making marks on my canvas. I'm not thinking of anything. I'm just pushing paint on. Back in the day, this paint actually was made with tar, which is why it's got the name Asphaltum, but I like to use this as a dark. I don't have anything against using black in any of my paintings. I know sometimes people do, but I like to use this as my dark. I think it's just better than using um, a burnt sienna or a burnt umber and blue mix. I just, I just like it because it's so earthy. So I might hit some gray in. And let's go even faster with it. So I'm just going to scoop up all of my gray. And I'm going to keep turning my canvas too, because I don't want to fall in love with anything at this point. I don't know what this is going to turn out to be. So you just keep moving the paint around. And this is the way you really start learning how these tools and this wax can be used to create different shapes, different forms. It's just by playing with it and not being like um, concerned about making like my next epic painting that I'm going to sell or put in a show you know you have to kind of give that all up especially when you try something new and just kind of go for it there's no limit to the number of layers you can put on uh oh, i know let's kind of thin some of it out now this is on that oil paper so it's really it soaks in like almost immediately i have no extra gesso or anything on it but but well, look at how I can pull this and kind of create even some other marks. And I can just get such an organic, cool background for something else, even if I wanted to paint something traditional on it. And there's this little guy again. And I'm just using up paint, like you guys asked. So this is just me playing around with leftover paint. <laughs> Just whatever I had mixed up is going on. Back flat for a minute. Gonna use up all this white paint. So I just took everything that was on my palette and now it's going on here. So this would kind of be like that glaze I started with that was orange. This would be, you know, layer one of a painting. Remnants of it will show through, maybe a lot, maybe a little, maybe none of it eventually. But I, just, I like to keep moving it around. And I feel like once I get one layer on it, it's much easier to control then because I have, you know, just like doing a traditional wash with a regular painting, you kind of need that underbelly. Or if you're doing a pastel and you use watercolor, you know, anything like that. It's just nice having that little bit of tone to play with. So this is kind of nice and neutral. Just pick some of that up and maybe not just draw through with my brush. And I'm going to take a crinkled up piece of paper. And in all this wet paint, 
I can now come in and just press into it. And it's almost like I'm, I'm making a texture and then I'm stamping and moving it around. And that is going to be really cool to paint on tomorrow. Wow. So if I can get a close shot of it, you can kind of see how it's just building up this interesting texture. That looks really good, Karen. You know, and, and you know, maybe, I don't know what it'll turn into. It's exciting. I can't even say maybe it'll be this or that because I just don't even know. <laughs> yeah, but it's so it's, exciting, it, you know. It's, it's just a base coat and I've got some shapes that I can come in and play with, you know. Yeah. I can take a really small brush now, a really thin brush, and just kind of thin down some paint. And then I could always just start drawing in to some of these shapes and, you know, saying, where do I think this could go? And before this layer even dries, I can kind of start working something out. I and love that. And if you don't like it, you just go over it. Absolutely. But it's, it's you know, it's already kind of getting some like, I don't know, some movement. It's got, you know, some calm areas. And that's what all these different tools do. They allow you to make, you know, nice, big, wide, long, smooth areas and then I've got that clumpy stuff so that's that's why I like that this is all kind of smooth in here and then it kind of starts breaking into this chaos <laughs> with what is the gesso board this will pull this back to the white of the canvas with the oil paper it won't the oil paper absorbs so much that it's like it's already stained there's really no going back to the white of the um, paper with this so you know you got to try your different your, your different boards and stuff because everybody's going to like something different and and i like all different ones for different things i like the so contrast of the textures with the smoothness it just so that's one of those three c's so we've got smooth we've got thick already even in in just layer one We've got darks, we've got lights. Overall, it's kind of medium. So probably the next thing I would do is bring in like a lighter light. I would start kind of playing with that, maybe even darken up a dark. But all I did is use all my leftover paint. All right, would so, you, Karen, would you introduce another color at this point? Yeah, I would probably come in and put something else in. Yellow or red or something? Yeah, I would definitely come in on like I would want this warm. all to dry because if I if I put too much in too fast, it's going to make mud. You guys know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And I look at a lot of people's cold wax paintings up on um there's like a Facebook page for cold wax painters and um a lot of them are kind of cringy because they put everything in them. So they look like mucked up color wheels. Ah. And I understand they're learning, they're playing, they're they're testing it out. But it's kind of important to make sure each layer dries thoroughly before you go back in. So then you're not going to mix mud. Right. I like some of it to mix, but I would definitely come back in, um, use like a really intense magenta, you know, like you guys kind of said, red. But right now, if I start playing with that, it's going to just get really, Bloody. really messy. Right. Yeah. So that's why, I, like for the first layer, I keep it a little bit more simple. I don't want to go too crazy with anything, but um, the, the, the joy of glazing is, even if I come in tomorrow, this is dry, I can mix up a red, but have enough wax and enough of my galkid in it that I could just pull the slightest little glaze. And maybe that's my next layer. So I don't have to be thick and, and, and really intense with the color. And, um, you know, I don't know if anyone's done a lot of glazing before, but, um, you know, that's basically how I build up all these layers. It's part glazing, part thick paint. Beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. Maybe, you know, oh, you know you, oh, and then if you do something like this, you might want to come in if you're more of a realist and put a figure in here or put a little barn back here in the distance, you know, put some buildings in or, you know, so it can, it can evolve and become anything, but if, if nothing else, it's a cool way to make a really fun background. I just want to make sure you guys can see like, um, you know, how you can apply it to all different styles. Look, like, Karen, uh, Karen, Karen, it looks like a restaurant table with people sitting all around. 
<laughs> oh, that's no. what I was thinking. No. <laughs> that's yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And, and I said, that's what I love about abstract art is everybody sees something different. Right. And, and that's super cool. And if you can find something in it, I, I love it even more, you know? Mm -hmm. It might not have been my intent, but hey, if it moves you and you like it, and then you start moving them around, like, would it look better this direction? Would yeah. it look better this direction? <laughs> you know? So any good abstract painting will work in any direction you flip it. If your design is balanced, and you know has some tension built up you'll be able to flip it anyway and like it just equally as well typically i pick an orientation that i like the best but i know that i could really put it anyway and if it doesn't work in all directions then something in it is weak and needs to be worked on yeah something's missing mm -hmm. yeah that's great did anybody do um a little practice <laughs> I did, and I, now I know why you wear gloves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm messy. It's, it's a little messy, uh, yeah. <laughs> but Debbie, are I you, don't have enough color. Debbie, are you going to show us yours? <laughs> I'd love to see it sometime. Oh, there you are. Okay. Well, what the heck? Oh, there I don't we know. go. Oh. I don't know. It's, it's, I just, I just, I only had three colors or you know so i can't like okay but already it's really cool because you've got that super light area in the bottom so it's already like catching my eye oh yeah so yeah, i'm gonna add I, more color to it tomorrow but yeah I, I have no i have no imagination <laughs> I'm a you realist. do you just did that <laughs> that's good very good yeah. but it was fun but like i said let's see yeah <laughs> yeah, I always wear gloves because I like to use them kind of, and, and, you know, I, I use them as a tool. But my gloves are a tool. Yeah. As crazy as that seems, but, um, and what I could do is, um, I think you guys have seen this stuff, but if you wanted to see like a big painting, like, you know, that I've spent a lot of time on and, and see all the layers. And again, this is, this is phase one. So on that painting you're working on, keep going at it. It might take you a year okay. or two years to be where you're like, yeah, this is done. I like this. I'm going to frame it. And it's cool. Just whenever you have leftover paint on a painting, play with it. Now, if you want to put a figure on it, like the one you were talking about just now, yeah. would you use straight oil or would you use the cold wax and oil again? to make Cold it, wax and oil. It seems hard. To, you you would mix, you mix your wax in every single layer of it. And you can paint okay. with it just like you would paint your traditional oil painting. It's just going to feel a little different. If it feels yeah. too sticky to you, you're going to want to use a little bit of some Galkid or some Galkid gel, um, any of the, the different mediums. Even if you have some, I hate to say it because I'm not a fan of um, liquid, but if you have liquid, use liquid. And it'll okay. just move the paint a little bit more and it'll bring back a little bit more shine consistency to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, thank you, know, you. You can get stuff from like crazy fun color to, you know, very muted, boring colors. But typically my first layer of all my paintings are charcoal drawings. Charcoal and paint thinner and I just make some shapes. Then I start coming in with paint. Huh. So I, I, I have some step-by-step um, -step things that I've done where I took a picture of it when it was just a drawing and then a picture of it when I started adding color and then what it turned into. And what it turns into is never anything like what the first drawing was, but it just evolves. And that's kind of the cool thing because, um, you know, I just keep making decisions on the fly. And that's why, you know, being more of a traditional painter or, you know, painting landscapes from life is really helpful to do this kind of stuff because you kind of learn how to see things and just see the big shapes and things. So then as you're working on this, I just know, oh, I've got a nice dark here, so I should put a nice light underneath it. And it's, it's like you just train your brain to see things like that, just to really simplify everything and see shapes. And then you'll start like, um, uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone's done a project um, once or twice where you just did a crazy like background with like really drippy paint and then you painted like a frog or something into it. Kind of the yeah. same difference. I'm just using wax. So that's why I just really want to push that home because um, I notice online they kind of make it seem like it's this really mysterious kind of cool thing. And, and honestly, it's just a medium. 
it's the oil paint that's doing all the work. This is just drying it, making it transparent, and you know, just doing some different things to your paint. So, any other questions or anybody want to show something? Who else worked? Anybody? I just listened. I have all of my arms. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Oh, that's just my other arm. <laughs> Janet, did you do it? No. She was going to. No, no. Well, it's enough to get you started. I feel like it's enough of a just glimpse of what you can do. And I tried to show you a variety of things so you could really, um, you know, start start your own quest. Look, I gathered, I gathered a whole bunch of tools. Oh, cool. Oh, that's cool. I've never seen that before. This one? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's because I have my grandkids painting here. And every tool is going to make a different mark. And that's, that's kind of the fun of it. And then you're going to find your favorite one. And then yeah. you're going to start using it over and over. And once you do a lot of them, you'll know exactly what kind of technique you can make and how much pressure, how much wax. But I really, I mean, I've been doing it for a very long time. But in the beginning, I look at my first paintings. They're actually still up on my website. I'm like, oh my God, those, those are so <laughs> terrible. And I'm sure I'm gonna think my paintings now are terrible in another couple of years too, but that's a good process to go through because then you're just growing. And that's what you always wanna do. You just, you don't wanna just stay comfortable. You get comfortable and then, you know, you're, you, you forget about that artistic journey and it's scary sometimes and it's frustrating as hell sometimes. But that's just the roller coaster ride we all go on, and you're not gonna get that reward unless you put the time in. And you just have to do it a lot. That's true. That's true with any medium. And and even if you're a writer, same thing. Like doesn't matter what you do, it, you have to do a lot of it in order to really get good at it because it's almost like muscle memory. It's hard to explain to someone how you do what you do because you just know how to do it. Right. And then you have to really stop and think, what did I do to make that happen? Because, you, you know, your brain and your hand just become in sync and you turn your brain off. You just got to tell your brain to shut up because sometimes that's the thing that's got the ego that makes us want to make it good and want to make it perfect. And, yeah. you know, it, it, none of it's perfect. And even mine, I'm like, oh, this is terrible. This is a disaster. And people are like, no, I really like it. I'm like, no. And then I'll go back in and completely obliterate it and be like, oh man, I probably shouldn't have done that. And then I make something I like. So it, it, it's just, um, I never get too upset about it because I know I have that out. It's not like doing watercolor where, oh my God, you make a mistake, you're done. Um, I mean, I guess there's ways you can save those too, but I prefer the ease of just putting on another layer, scraping something off um, and having that exit strategy. Right. And that always, makes me feel confident. As a watercolorist, I know I can always cover it up with acrylic. <laughs> <laughs> what I like about your medium is that it's so flexible. It gives the artist so much freedom. Yeah, oh, you yeah. have total control over anything you're going to do with it. You know, and, and, and that's, it's, it's hard to explain to someone when you first are you know, exposed to it, but um, I just, once I, once I saw this and I took a workshop on it, I, I never, I don't even want to do regular mixed media stuff anymore. I just want to play with my oil paint. I could do anything with it. And, you know, I can still do an acrylic wash underneath if I want to. I can start out, you know, with anything, as long as I have it sealed, then I can go back on top with oil paint. And I will, I'm going to write myself a note because I am going to test it out on some watercolor. I promised you that, so I'm going to make myself a note so I don't forget to do a test. Cold wax on oil color. Well, this was, this was fun. It was um, the freedom of it, yeah. Yeah. Not, not looking at a photo. Yeah, it's yeah. so expressive, you know. Yeah. And I've done these where I've put figures into them. I've, you know, I've, I've kind of run the gamut. Um, so, you know, I don't want you to be afraid to try it in a more traditional way. Um, 
I, I even saw a video years ago of a guy who was just doing a tree and he wanted the tree bark to really stick out. So we just mixed some cold wax with this paint. He was able to get that without using a whole tube of oil paint. You know, anytime I have like, especially like teenagers that are, are painting and they're like, oh, I want to do a palette knife painting. And then they're all upset and crying because they're out of paint. Well, one of the ways to alleviate that is to add this medium cold wax. And then you, you definitely, you're doubling your paint. Yeah. So you're not wasting as much oil. You're just adding that medium in to build it up. And they have things like that for acrylic paint too. They have different mediums that can build up the consistency. But, um, you know, I like to go super, super thick, but I also like thin, little, tiny, slow glazes too. And that's how you just build up, you know, that really complex depth and, and history in your paintings. And check out some different artists out there that are doing it because um, everybody does it a little bit differently. And um, it's just even like with, with anything, I like to pick a selective color scheme before I start. So I don't end up going down that road of making, you know, a vomited color wheel because that happens a lot, especially with even mixed media art. You know, we get so excited and we get overwhelmed by all the possibilities of all the colors that are in front of us. So if you kind of pre-pick and you can always grab more paint, grab other things, but then you can, you can ensure yourself you're going to come out with a pretty good painting. As long as you got your values, you've got your different colors, you've got your different temperatures, you know, stick to those basic design principles and, and ask them over and over in your head and, and you'll answer your own question. So usually, you know, if I say, huh, what's going on with this one? The answer is right here in front of me. I'll probably need to pull out a little bit more orange or put a little bit more paint on. So I'll just have to think about it, look at it from a distance a couple times, and it might just be one more little spot of color that I'll hit and I'll pull it back together. So you gotta, you gotta just slow down on them and let them sit. Um, how, how am I on time? Have I gone over time? I have a feeling I <laughs> talked an awful lot. I'm not sure, I got lost and I have no idea what time it is. I don't either. Oh, it's uh, nine o'clock. Okay, well, that's perfect. That's nine to four, so. Awesome. Perfect. It was fast. You, you gave us so much. I hope it wasn't too much and I didn't freak you out, so. No, 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 no. It was, was very insightful and it made me um, and everybody else realize that it's not so scary and complex. It sounds like, it, like you said, it sounds like some foreign media that's so, you know, threatening, but you've made it look so um, approachable. Yeah, and it, so, and it really is. is. So if you guys ever have any questions or anything, I'm always open, you know, shoot me an email or, or anything. And if, if you progress, um, like Debbie, if you work on that and you want to ask me <laughs> my thoughts, go right ahead. Okay. Um, all right. If you forgot a step, if I threw, because I, I did kind of give you everything, a quick overview of all the weird stuff I use. Um, might not always use them in every painting, but that's kind of every trick I can do. But that's what you're going to learn. You're going to learn how to pull out some really cool tricks that people are going to be like, dude, that's so cool. And you'll be like, oh my God, it was just, it was a spray bottle with paint thinner in it or something, you know? Yeah, that's great. So if, if they want to contact you, they can always go through your website, seikostudios.com. And yes. uh, if they want to see more of your work, it's there. And uh, also it's in the interview that we did, the videos. So they can see it there too. Yes. Thanks again, Val, for that video. It was very enlightening and very in intriguing. It really drew me into tonight's. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. That's good to know because this is my first time ever doing anything in front of a camera. And so I, even though I knew I was just like talking, I was still kind of nervous. <laughs> I don't know. Yep. Not tonight I wasn't, but like when he was just asking me questions, like, I don't know, I just kind of got all nervous. But um, I don't like being behind a camera or, you know, in front of the camera talking. I like to hide behind it and do something else. <laughs> I'm so. with you there. But I feel yep. a lot better being live with all of you guys. That, that's makes me feel a lot more comfortable. Now you know well, why I'm a photographer. Gonna... Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome job, Karen. It was good. Oh, cool. Thank you guys for having mm -hmm. me. I appreciate your time. And Thank uh, you for doing it. Yeah, welcome thanks. to Cold Wax. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Like, uh, thank you. Thank you.
Yes, thank you, please. Karen. Thank you guys so much. I had a really good time and yeah, just uh, hit me up anytime and I'd love to see and hear from you guys if you decide to, to try experimenting with this. Will do. Okay. okay. Hi, Eric. I see you in the background. Thanks, you right there. <laughs> He's been here the whole time listening, catching and yeah. taking it all in. <laughs> Good job, Karen. Yeah, awesome. Thank you guys so much was... again, and um, I'll talk to you guys soon. Okay. Thank you, okay. Karen. And Thank you, Thanks. everyone. Good night. Uh, remember, Bye. we're recording Bye, this. Jeff. So we'll send the link out uh, probably tomorrow sometime. Okay. Good job.